This is Daniel Simon at Baton Rouge Community College. This is, of course, week five of my podcast lecture on the, um, it was really becoming the early, uh, early Middle Ages. Uh, but last week we had, of course, talked about the uh, later or late Roman Empire, um, going back to the time of Emperor Theodosius the Great. Uh, we also talked about the beginning of um, how the Western Empire collapsed in the West with the uh, invasion of the barbarians. Uh, and then I also had talked about the early history of the Byzantine or Byzantine Empire, which is also called the Eastern Roman Empire. So in a sense, this is really the early Middle Ages that we're talking about because early Middle Ages really start around about the 4th, 5th century. And uh, of course, the next thing I will be talking about this week uh, will be the rise of Islam. Um, if I have any time, I'll also talk about the early Middle Ages under the Franks. If not, we'll do it next week. So the rise of Islam, um, that of course happened uh, in the Middle East uh, in an area that is now called the Arabian Peninsula. So that's where Islam developed uh, roughly about 1,500 years ago or, or less, really. Uh, Islam developed kind of between the 16th, uh, the 6th and the 7th centuries CE is about when it got started. And a little bit about the Arabian Peninsula. Arabian Peninsula um, is kind of a map of spread of Islam here, but the uh, Arabian Peninsula is located, you can see, between what is uh, Egypt, which is right here, and I guess what would be Persia, which is over here, Persian Iraq. So it's kind of between the two. It is located in what is what would be southwestern Asia. That would be the geographic aspect of the, that part of the world. And it's a very, it's an area which, um, I guess it's about the size of maybe, I think some people think it's about maybe the, almost a third the size of maybe the United States, or at least the lower 48. That's about how big it is. It's mostly a desert area. Majority of it is desert. Um, of course, it has a bunch of countries there now. Saudi Arabia, of course, takes up most of the space there where the Arabian Peninsula is. Uh, also, Kuwait, uh, Yemen, Oman, and a few other, Qatar, and a few other countries are pretty much considered in what would be the area of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, of course, most of the people that lived there were Arab people. Uh, Arabs, of course, were a type of Semitic people, you know, similar to like Jews. And uh, these were commonly a desert people uh, that were sometimes called Bedouin. Bedouin were like desert dwellers that lived off the desert or they lived in oases uh, throughout that area. And uh, so their way of life was more difficult, having to live throughout the deserts of that area of, Arab of Arabia. Now, um, religious-wise, they were behind everybody else. Uh, most people, like at least in the Western world, started to become monotheistic. Uh, prior to Muhammad, uh, most Arab people uh, were um, polytheistic, uh, worshiping like these pre-Islamic pagan gods uh, that were often called jinn spirits, J-I-N-N. And uh, these were types of spirits that uh, inhabited nature, like the rocks and deserts and the land. And uh, Mecca, which is in, you know, western part of Saudi Arabia, was uh, the um, center of these pagan cults originally. Mecca was important because it was um, like a big trading area in the Middle East. Uh, it's where a lot of the caravan routes ran from, I guess, the east through Arabia and then into Africa so Mecca was important for trade, and then also it was kind of like a pilgrimage site where a lot of Arabs would go uh, to worship a lot of these early pre-Islamic gods. And a lot of them were placed in this huge um, Kaaba, you know about it, um, this building where they put the idols in it, uh, which now only houses the famous black stone of Mecca, which some people believe is some type of stone or meteorite. Uh, that was placed there either by Muhammad or 
somebody else before Muhammad. It's a debate about that. So Mecca became a holy city, and Mecca was one of, you know, two major important cities that'll be where Islam will de develop, which the other one later is Medina, which is north of Mecca. Uh, who was Muhammad? Muhammad, of course, you know, is the greatest prophet in Islam. Uh, of course, he's the one uh, that is considered the founder of Islam. And uh, Muhammad was believed to have been some kind of um, caravan, and mer caravan trader and merchant uh, that lived in Mecca. He was born, they think, close to about 570 CE, sometime in the late 6th century. Not much is known about Muhammad's early life, but uh, what they do know is that uh, by his 20s, he had become a successful merchant in Mecca. And he worked for this wealthy woman uh, who, whose name was uh, Khadija. And so he became wealthy because of her. And so he helped run her business and all that. And But uh, apparently um, Muhammad wasn't satisfied with um, just, you know, doing business like he was doing. I think by the time he reached like 40, he uh, sought like religious ideas. And uh, he did, I think, look at, I think he looked at Christianity and uh, Judaism, I think, as various religions at the time. But um, Muhammad uh, would go off to like, I think, nearby caves where Mecca was. And he started having these visions where the archangel Gabriel came to him and told him that he was the last great prophet uh, of, of Allah, which is God, and um, that he would be basically Allah's main messenger uh, to spread his message of Allah. And so that would eventually lead to Muhammad developing Islam as a, a monotheistic religion, which was first spread to the Arabs and to other people later. Uh, and um, uh, because at the time, you know, the, the Arabs were still pagan overall. And uh, at first, uh, when he created this religion, uh, very few people would follow him. I think some of his relatives joined him and some friends at first. He may have had a dozen or more followers at first. Uh, but um, I think in the 610s, which is when he developed the religion, a lot of people didn't didn't understand what he was trying to do. And so in Mecca, they were kind of fearful about what this new religion was going to do to Mecca. Mecca, you know, was supposed to be this big trading place. They were also worried about the pilgrimage site, that it might scare away pilgrims and all that. And so some people in Mecca forced it out. They forced basically uh, Muhammad to flee. Uh, you know, Mecca, the so-called flight of, uh, of, of um, Muhammad, uh, also called Hezra, I think Hezra, I think is the, or Hezra, I think is how you say it, Arabic. And um, so he's forced to flee, uh, and he flees to Medina, which is to the north. Medina's original name was Yethreb, uh, later called Medina, which means the city of the prophet. And it's there at Medina that uh, Muhammad would start really to develop Islam as a religion. And really the first major mosque was built there, uh, which was later referred to as the Grand Mosque. Well, not the Grand Mosque, the um, Prophet's Mosque, they call it actually. It's the one that first is found. That's the one where uh, Muhammad's actually buried later, after he dies. Um, now the terms Islam, uh, the term um, Muslim, what does that mean? Uh, well, the word Islam means in uh, Arabic, it means submission or surrender to God. So these are people surrendering to Allah, basically. And then those that are Muslim are considered surrendering ones, surrendering to Allah, and um, or submissive ones. Some say submissive or surrendering ones, Muslim. And um, so uh, within so many years, uh, they'll eventually write down uh, Muhammad's, you know, teachings uh, that were supposedly given to him through Gabriel. That'll be what we call the Quran, Quran, which will be developed, which is the uh, holy book of uh, Islam. So that'll be developed over, it takes a while for them to develop the Quran, but it's over a period of like maybe 20, 30 years it's eventually developed. And I think close to six, I think it's 650, I think may have been 
they eventually published the first editions of the Koran, which will be, of course, later. Uh, so uh, in throughout most of Arabia, you know, it was, you can see here in that kind of red area, which is right here, those are all the areas that Muhammad was able to convert to his religion um, throughout most of like the main part of Arabia. So he actually would take back Mecca uh, and they'll eventually build a mosque there too, the Grand Mosque, I think is what they call it, where they have the Kaaba now. And um, he would die in 632, I think is the year, in his early 60s. And from there, what will happen is that then Islam will eventually start spreading later. You can see it will spread throughout North Africa, uh, you know, from Egypt all the way to Morocco and Spain, and then you can see it even spreads up into Iraq, Persia, all the way to like close to India. So eventually it's going to take a while for it to spread, but Islam spreads within less than one and a half centuries. It'll eventually spread within so many years after Muhammad dies. Um, so yeah, of course the Quran would be developed, like I said, uh, overall, you know, the word Quran, by the way, uh, it means in Arabic reciting uh, because supposedly uh, what was written later was recited to Muhammad uh, through Gabriel. So hence, that's why they call it that. And you can see it's spelled different ways. But that's just the transliteration of, from the Arabic that you're looking at. So, but it wouldn't be to like 450 uh, until the Quran's really... Uh, compiled totally, uh, which will be done by one of the early caliphs, uh, which will be, uh, which caliph was it that developed it? I believe it was, um, I think under, there's the other guy, I'm trying to think, oh yeah, Uthman. I'll get to Uthman later, but they think he's the one that finalized it. Now, um, of course, the uh, Koran also developed what they call the five pillars of Islam. These are various teachings of Muhammad uh, that were kind of set down through the Quran uh, that most Muslims should follow as kind of a guideline on right living uh, with their way of life and also with the religion of Islam. And uh, the five main ones you see there are, um, they have faith, of course, shahada, uh, which is like the faith in Allah and that Muhammad's, you know, the prophet, uh, and, uh, of course, uh, strict Muslims also tend to pray five times a day. And that's why you see those minarets there, by the way, which are part of, I guess, what was originally a mosque. Um, they took the Hagia Sophia and the, Tur uh, the Turks and turned it into a mosque. And, yeah, the minarets are basically uh, used to, you know, call Muslims to prayer, like at certain times a day, five times a day, usually. And uh, usually facing towards Mecca, traditionally, is what it is. Um, that's the second one. The prayer is the second one. So faith, faith in God, and then prayer, and of course, and with that, uh, is the second one. Uh, prayer. The word for prayer is salat, of course. Um, then alms or alms giving, sakat, uh, is basically where you would give so much of your wealth uh, to uh, the poor to help people out. Uh, which could be a certain percentage of your wealth, maybe as much as 20%, uh, basically, you would give people to help help the poor out. Uh, fasting, uh, psalm, which is uh, usually during Ramadan, um, they would have like a holy month, but they would fast, and basically during the, during the day, you wouldn't be able to eat or drink anything. So... Um, and then, of course, the last one, the fifth one, is the Hajj, where it's believed that uh, at least once a lifetime that a Muslim should make a pilgrimage to uh, Mecca, basically, so-called Hajj or pilgrimage. Other beliefs, of course, in Islam, of course, some you know, strict, you know, Muslims, kind of like Jews, don't eat pork. Now, that's considered not kosher, I guess. Uh, of course, some don't drink. I know some Muslims that do drink, though. <laughs> I'll tell you that. But, um, yeah, a lot of places, like in the Middle East, it's forbidden alcohol. You know, uh, like you can't even buy it, that kind of thing. 
Uh, yeah, you can marry up to four wives, although they say Muhammad may have had close to 12 wives. He had a bunch, but uh, they could marry so many wives. But some states have banned that, and you can only have one wife, you know. But some states, like in the Middle East, you still can marry multiple women. Um, it's supposed to be forbidden to marry non-Muslims, too. Um, although some people marry non-Muslims, but they have to convert, uh, basically. Uh, of course, a place of worship for Muslims is a mosque, as you know. Uh, there's different famous mosques, uh, of course, uh, that I can talk about. Um, yeah, the one I just mentioned, the Grand Mosque, uh, the Great Mosque, that's in Mecca. That's where the Kaaba is. Uh, and that's, you know, the Kaaba is believed to be some kind of stone or uh, some people think it's a meteorite, too, uh, that was put there, they think, by um, Muhammad. Uh, I think some Muslims even believe that the Kaaba may have been originally built by Abraham like a long time ago, uh, traditionally. And um, but it's like the holiest ground, really, you know, in Islam, the Grand Mosque overall. They also have the Prophet's Mosque, I told you about, which is in Medina, which Medina is north of Mecca in western Saudi Arabia. Like I said, that's the location where Muhammad's actually buried. He's buried actually in part of it. I think it has a green dome to it, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and then, oh, there's another one that's real holy too, which is the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is in Jerusalem. It's on the Temple Mount, uh, which was built later. Um, and uh, that one's considered pretty important, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And, um, and then they have another uh, building that's famous that's also on the um, Temple Mount uh, in Jerusalem, which is the Dome of the Rock. Uh, Dome of the Rock is a uh, Islamic shrine. Uh, that was later built in Jerusalem, and it's supposed to be the site where Muhammad descended to heaven. Although, I think most historians think Muhammad actually died in Arabia. He never really got to Israel, Palestine area. But um, but anyway, just talking about some of the background of uh, Islam. Um, now, yeah, like I said, Islam expanded, like I told you, uh, it, it pushed, I think they seem to think into uh, Syria first, took over Syria where Israel is, Palestine and Syria, uh, pushed into Egypt. Uh, then it went into Turkey, um, then uh, into Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan. And then, yeah, at one point, I think under the Mughal Empire, it pushed into part of India too as well. And it pushed all the way to Morocco, like from, you know, Egypt, Libya, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco. And yes, yeah, some of them did push into Spain because uh, some of the um, Muslims conquered Spain and defeated the uh, Visigothic kingdom, crushed it and developed their own state that was also there. So, it, yeah, yeah, it did, does push into there. And there are parts of Eastern Europe where a lot of Muslims are still around that area, like as far as in the like where like the former Yugoslavia area in that region, there's some people that are still Muslim because under the Ottoman Empire, that was an area that they controlled at one point. Same thing with Romania, Romania Bulgaria, that area too. Now, after Muhammad died, there was a bunch of these um, leaders that were that, that followed Muhammad, they were kind of like political religious leaders that was called a caliph. A caliph was this, the caliph was an uh, Arabic term that meant um, meant uh, successor, because they were considered successors to Muhammad. Uh, it comes from the Arabic word khalifa, and uh, the 630s, they took over after Muhammad died. Most of them were not related to Muhammad. Uh, like the first guy, uh, Abu Baker, it was like only like two or three years, the first really leader of the of the, of the uh, Islamic movement. He was a father-in-law of Muhammad. One of his daughters had married Muhammad. And he took over after Muhammad died. And they think under him, they started to spread Islam up into like Syria. That was the first place they went into at that point. Uh, however, he died in 634. And then uh, another great... Uh, leader that came next, who was a caliph, was uh, Umar, or Omar, they called him, who reigned about maybe 10 years. 
he uh, conquered, finished the conquest of Syria, and then Omar was the one that took over us, uh, Persia and Egypt. So under him, it spread further. Like, and by that time of his death, I think all those areas in red and orange are all the areas that pretty much Islam has spread to. So you can see by the time that would be like getting close to 650 CE, it's about how far Islam's gotten at that point. Um, it's a debate about whether he may have been the one that built the dome of the rock, which is possible. Um, I think it's kind of sometime around that time when it's built, I know. Um, and then Uthman, there's another one, Uthman, he was a third caliph. Uthman was, a um, Omar, by the way, who, who was he? He was a friend of Muhammad, like a companion of his. Uh, and then Uthman was a, a companion of, a friend of uh, Muhammad too. He was actually um, one of Muhammad's son-in-laws. He married one of Muhammad's daughters. And Uthman was in there for about 12 years as caliph. And uh, he's important because they think under Uthman, uh, the, the uh, Koran was completed. Like the first major edition that they put together. So it's about mid-7th century when the Koran's completed at that point. Uh, he was assassinated, though, and uh, then Ali came in. Ali, A-L-I, Ali. Ali was a, a cousin and son-in-law of Muhammad, the only one related to Muhammad, uh, the original four caliphs, successors to Muhammad that took over. And um, that started a controversy because Ali and his son, he had a son named uh, Hussein, you may have heard of, and um, both of them were both, I think, murdered. I think they both were assassinated, I believe. He, because Ali was killed in 661, and then his son um, Hussein was also killed in 680 CE, uh, and what is the Battle of Karbala, which happened in Iraq in 680 CE. It's kind of considered a turning point in the history of Islam, because they believe that after 680, what happened, Islam split in half, uh, two different uh, religious sects uh, after that. And those that were born in the East, um, like Syria to Iraq, I guess, became more what they call Shia or Shiite Muslims. Uh, these were people that followed uh, Ali and his descendants. They believed that they were the only ones that were the correct descendants of Muhammad, the you know the successor to the prophet, uh, and um, they also considered I think Ali and Hussein to be uh, the first imams, which are these religious, political, spiritual leaders in the Islamic nation, which is called the Ummah or community, and um, and so they over time will become kind of like a separate religion in Islam. And then the majority of most Muslims are what they call Sunni, Sunni Muslim, uh, to make up, I don't know, it must be three-fourths or more, I guess. Because I know that Shiites are minority, uh, which are mostly like from Syria to maybe Iraq and Iran, etc. Uh, and um, But they would split because of the differences between the, the two different ones and the um, Sunni uh, believed that it didn't matter. Like, you didn't have to be related to Muhammad to be his successor. Uh, but the Shiites thought you did. You know, that was one of the big controversies that really split them apart, you know. Um, then, of course, that what happened, uh, then Islam then uh, split into, like, these um, caliphates, they call them, or caliphate empires that they have later uh, which is two of them that form. There's one, the first one that was formed around 661 after Ali died uh, was called the Umayyad Caliphate. Yeah, Umayyad. The Umayyad Caliphate was a caliphate uh, that was kind of descended from um, Uthman and his descendants. Uh, and it was related through a general that was named uh, Muwaya. Muwaya, who was like the governor of Syria. Uh, M-U-A-W-I-Y-A-H, Muwaya. And he was a relative of Uthman. And he was like the governor of Syria. And he was some kind of um, general of some type. And uh, he was believed to be the one that founded Damascus, which is now the capital of Syria. And Damascus became like the capital 
of the Umayyad Caliphate Empire at the time. Uh, which they ruled that region from 661 to 750. And uh, however, the Shiites didn't like the Umayyads because they were Sunni, Sunni Muslim. Uh, so they backed this other family uh, to take power, which was called the Abbasids, which would be the Abbasid Caliphate dynasty. The Abbasids were a type of dynasty that was believed to have been descended through Muhammad, through one of his uncles that was related to like a great-grandfather like going way back before Muhammad. Uh, his name was uh, Abu al-Abbas as-Sufah, Sufa, A-S-S-U-F-F-A-H. Yeah, Abu al-Abbas as-Sufa. And um, uh, as-Sufa or al-Abbas, whichever we want to call him, uh, basically founded the uh, Abbasid uh, dynasty. He overthrew the uh, Umayyads, Supposedly killed them, murdered them off, killed them off. That was around 750. And then what happened was uh, in what is the eastern part of the empire in Iraq, they that became the center of the Abbasid Caliphate type empire. And um, over time, uh, by I think the late 8th eight, century, Baghdad was established, which Baghdad was founded by a son of um, al-Abbas, uh, which was, his name was al-Mansur. You may have heard of him. Uh, Mansur was a famous caliph, and he was a, may have been a general as well. But he founded um, Baghdad, which is now the capital of Iraq. So, uh, so those are the two main um, caliphate dynasties they had. You know, the Umayyad, the oldest, and then the caliphate, one of the Abbasids. The Abbasids one would last from 750, uh, and it goes up to like, um, I forget the year it ended, but 1,000, I thought it was 1,050 around that time is about when it ends. Um, actually, 1,055 to be exact, because when the Abbasid one ends. Now, what happened to the Abbasids? Well, the Abbasids got eventually overrun by the Turks. The Turks eventually came out of um, Central Asia. These were Caucasian peoples that invaded the Middle East. They eventually converted to Sunni Islam and uh, basically overrun like Syria, Turkey, Egypt, uh, etc. And uh, they're called the Seljuk Turks, were the original Turks that, you know, basically start settling there around the 11th century. And uh, then, yeah, the Ottoman Turks later that are like cousins of the Seljuk Turks as well. And they would eventually um, conquer the region, pretty much crush the um, air power in, in the region. And so the Turks become the overwhelming power in the Middle East at that time. And um, Seljuk Turks um, were one of the groups that caused the decline of the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine Empire at that time was starting to decline around the uh, Middle Ages. And uh, I think I told you before in the previous lecture that one of the pivotal battles that caused the decline of the Byzantine Empire was the Battle of Manzikert that happened in 1071. And what is Eastern Turkey, the Seljuk Turks routed uh, the Byzantine armies, and that led to the fall of pretty much Turkey and all that that was, you know, under their control. And then that would cause the shrink of Byzantine, their their lands, which will start to shrink around. I think at that point it's got mostly just Western Turkey and part of Greece. So it's shrinking more and more at that point. And um, that would bring on the Crusades, which we'll get to later. And the Crusades uh, were a series of wars where the Catholic West um, fought to try to help out the Byzantine Empire, you know, get back lands lost to the Turks. These series of wars would last something like two centuries between the 11th the 13th centuries and even kept dragging on, I think, up until like the 13, 1400s. Um, 
Then the Ottoman Empire formed, uh, which the Ottoman Empire didn't really form until like around the 15th century. Uh, the Ottomans were a collection of states that became a vast empire, which uh, you can kind of see in this map, which is right here. The Ottoman Empire will eventually stretch from what is uh, like around Turkey and Greece. But you can see it eventually at one point, it'll control pretty much Egypt and parts of North Africa, Iraq and part of Persia, Greece, go all the way up into Hungary, Austria, uh, and it actually at one point control the Crimea, like in southern Ukraine. So they had a vast empire, uh, the Ottoman Empire, and you can see it peaked. Uh, that's the peak of it between the 15th and 16th centuries. After that, it starts shrinking uh, over time. So so-called Ottoman Empire. Uh, the Ottomans were ruled by uh, sultans, you know, about this. It was like, kind of like an emperor. And supposedly the first um, sultan that ruled over them was a, a ruler named Osman, O-S-M-A-N, or Osman I. That's the origin of where the term Ottoman came from, supposedly. But the Ottomans were like kind of like cousins of the Seljuk Turks, basically. And... Um, Really, the 16th century is the peak of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, I think the most famous Ottoman sultan they had was Suleiman the first, also called Suleiman the Great, who reigned from 520 to 520 to 1566. I actually called him Suleiman the Magnificent. I think is usually what they call him. Actually, he reigned 46 years, which is the longest reigning of all the different sultans of the Ottoman Empire. And, um, but uh, over time, uh, what happened to the uh, Ottomans is by the 16, 1700s, they started to decline as a power and lose territory. Uh, in the 1800s, uh, some people in Europe started calling the Ottoman Empire the sick man of Europe because uh, it was declining. And it began losing all of its European territories, like from around Austria, Hungary, Greece, and so on. All those broke up into different nation states that are in that area now, uh, today. And then, of course, the thing that killed off the Ottoman Empire over time was World War One. Uh, World War, in World War One, the Ottoman Empire um, supported the German side in the war. Germany ended up losing the war, and um, the British, with Arab help, like you know, Arab peoples. Uh, that are in the region, the Middle East, helped to defeat the Ottoman Empire, which eventually broke up. And the, uh, the Ottoman Empire, like where Turkey is, became the Republic of Turkey, and then the other areas that are kind of around the Middle East from like, I guess, Jordan, Iraq, Israel, Syria, Egypt, and all that, will eventually become like nation states in the Middle East, which exists now. And that's partially all those states, you know, come about over time. But that's also why a lot of the Middle East is unstable, because since the Ottoman Empire broke up, you know, around 1918, 1919, um, yeah, that whole region's still unstable, you know, because of it. So that's been 100 years, and it's pretty much still like it. All right, uh, I've got a few minutes left, not much. Uh, I want to go ahead and talk about the... Um, early stages of the Middle Ages. We're kind of already in it at this point, uh, talking about the Middle Ages, because uh, really like the rise of Islam, you know, the late, later Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire, all that's part of the Middle Ages uh, at that point, or considered part of the Middle Ages. Uh, what is the Middle Ages? Well, the Middle Ages is a period that runs from roughly around 500 CE uh, to about 1500 CE, so about around 1,000 years. And it's an historical period which takes place between uh, the, I guess, the decline of the Roman Empire in the West and then the beginning of the Renaissance uh, in Europe, which is the beginning of the modern period. So it's kind of this between period or middle period that occurs between the decline of civilization and the beginning of modern civilization. Uh, and so the term medieval was later coined modern times, uh, which means um, middle age is what it means. So where the term middle age is kind of evolves from over time. And um, 
the um, Middle Ages um, is often seen as like the so-called Dark Ages. I heard that term being used a lot, the medieval Dark Ages. And yeah, it was a period where civilization really declined as a whole. And you know, people forgot to do a lot of things like they had before. Uh, even knowledge declined and joy of the population couldn't even read and write. Uh, basic things like that overall. And um, later on, historians, like medieval scholars, began to divide up the Middle Ages into like sub-periods uh, overall. And uh, there's usually three sub-periods of the Middle Ages. Uh, there's the uh, early Middle Ages, which go from 500 to 500 to about 1,000 CE. Um, and the High Middle Ages is like 1,000 to 1,300. And then the Late Middle Ages is 1,300 to the 1,500s. So early early Middle Ages is 500 to 1,000. Uh, high Middle Ages is 1,000 to 1,300. And then the Late Middle Ages, 13 to 1,500s. Uh, the early Middle Ages is the most dark age period. So that, that's kind of how bad it was, you know, during that time. Um, overall, and um, Europe at the t time had, you know, started to collapse because the Roman Empire, especially in the West, uh, wasn't doing well, uh, and um, then you got all these different Germanic and other barbarian peoples, you know, overrunning the West, so that created a lot of chaos uh, in Europe, and so you got this new medieval Europe that kind of emerges in Western, Central, Eastern Europe, um, as a whole, and uh, there's different things that influenced it overall um, that kind of made up what was this new Europe at that point, uh, and um, it's really a combination of like Germanic culture that, that was brought in, and that became mixed with the Roman culture that was already there, so you got this kind of synthesis of those two cultures kind of merging together. Uh, to become like one culture, even I guess the interbreeding of Roman peoples and Germ Germanic peoples and all that. And of course, the third thing, of course, there that was the Catholic Church, you know, the medieval Catholic Church based in Rome, Italy, uh, became one of the biggest influences on medieval Europe as a whole. Uh, a lot of the main scholars that still, you know, knew the languages and all that uh, were pretty much um, in the church. Uh, like St. Gregory of Tours, I'll mention, uh, was a famous Catholic monk, Christian monk, uh, that wrote one of the first historical works of like the medieval period, which was written, not sure exactly when it was one, they think it was written probably about late 6th century. And he wrote a book called The History of the Franks, you know, which is one of the first things we're going to talk about in medieval Europe, and the Franks were considered really one of the first important peoples uh, that was associated with uh, medieval Europe uh, as a whole. Uh, the Franks were Germanic peoples that came from northern Germany, and they settled in um, France sometime around the 5th century. And um, as you know, France was originally called Gaul. Well, the Franks started calling it Francia means the land of the Franks, and so over time, it became known as, you know, uh, France, basically. And um, the Franks were known for uh, being one of the first peoples that would kind of convert everybody to the Catholic faith in medieval Europe, and they were known for different dynasties. Uh, of course, one famous dynasty was the Merovingian dynasty, uh, which was believed to have been founded close to about, I think, 496, I think was the year when it was first, not four, yeah, 496, was that, no, 481, I think is how exactly they dated, 481 is when it was dated, excuse me, 481 CE or AD, and I think it lasted until 756, about 275 years, the Merovingians. Uh, this dynasty was a dynasty founded by uh, a king named King Clovis, also called Clovis I. Clovis was the first major Merovingian king. And um, he's important because uh, they believe that uh, Clovis was the first 
uh, Frankish king to convert the masses in Western Europe to the Catholic faith. Uh, in the West, they had Christianity, but it was like a um, version of like Arianism, which had, we had talked about before. That was still, it was still around Arianism as a variation of Christianity. But a lot of the German, Germanic peoples had kind of adopted that instead of the Catholic variation of it. And so from influence from Italy, from like Rome and all that, Clovis converted, I think they say around 496 CE, and they say how he converted was because of his wife. I think his wife kind of talked him into it. So Clovis is important um, uh, you know, in you know, converting people. And then uh, over time, um, what happened with the um, Frankish kings, the Frankish kings of the Merovingians will become figureheads over time, because of the rise of the major domo. What was the major domo? Uh, the major domo were these uh, political um, military leaders of the Franks that were powerful ministers that were under them. The word, mayor, the word um, major domo meant mayor of the palace. And they were believed to be these type of men that ran the household, well, like of the palace uh, like a powerful minister, and then over time, they basically became like the commander of the forces, military forces, like commander in chief. Uh, they dictated a lot of the policies, and they became the real, true heads of state, rather than the king. So some people sometimes compare a major domo to the prime minister, like in you know Britain, uh, which is the real de facto ruler, like over the government. And the monarch is just the head of the state, that kind of thing. So it's kind of been compared to that, you know, the major domo. Uh, who are some famous, famous major domos? Uh, one of the most famous, of course, I'll talk about today is um, Charles Martel. You got right here, uh, Martel. Uh, and his real name is uh, Carolus Magnus. No, no, excuse me, not Carolus. Ma Car Carolus Martellus, excuse me. Is that his Latin name? Yeah, Carolus Martellus, which Martellus in Latin means the hammer. And um, Charles Martel uh, was really the most famous of the major domos of the Franks who lived in the 8th century, 8th century CE. And uh, Martel, um, the study about him, was a really great, really good general, one of the best generals of the Franks. And of course, why was he called the hammer? Uh, he was called the hammer because we're hammering his enemies. And maybe he carried a hammer in battle, possibly as well. And um, one of the things that uh, he was known for, uh, Charles Martel, of course, was uh, Martel in 732, if you know about this, prevented an invasion of France by uh, the Muslim Moors. Uh, the Moorish peoples were um, kind of like Moroccan-type peoples that had taken over Spain, and they had destroyed the Visigothic kingdom there. And uh, they kind of controlled, like, Morocco and Spain, and uh, the Moors were a mix of peoples. I think they were a mix of Berber and I want to say Arabs, etc. And anyway, uh, they tried to invade France, and like you know, I guess convert it to Islam. And in October tenth, seven thirty-two, Battle of Tours, Martel's forces routed uh, the Moorish forces and ran them out of France. Uh, basically, drove them out. And um, that was an important turning point, they say, in medieval Europe, because they think that Martel, I guess, saved Western Europe uh, from being converted to Islam, and it would allow Catholicism to thrive later. Because, you know, the Franks will be the ones later that'll push the religion even further, you know, eastward and all that. And so that's why they're very important. Uh, also, you've got the, um, what happened over time was the Merovingian dynasty was then replaced by another dynasty called Carolingian, which was named after Charles Martel. And it was founded by this ruler named Pepin III, also called Pepin the Short. He was a major domo. And what happened was Pepin decided that he had had enough of this figurehead thing where, you know, the kings are the rulers and the major domos were the heads of state. 
And so uh, he basically overthrew uh, the Merovingians. And in 756 uh, AD or CE, they believe, he founded the Carolingian dynasty, named after his father, Charles Martel. And uh, this dynasty will go, I think it, it kind of a debate how far it goes up, but I believe the Carolingian dynasty lasts from 756, I think up to about 911 CE. So it lasts 100 something years more. Uh, who is the most famous ruler of the Carolingian dynasty? Uh, this ruler here, which of course, which is Charlemagne. Charlemagne uh, is a very famous ruler of the Franks who reigned between uh, the uh, 8th and 9th centuries uh, and um, probably the two greatest Frankish rulers of all time, Charles Martel and Charlemagne. And um, Charlemagne uh, was the longest reigning ruler of the Franks. He reigned like something like 46 years, from 768 uh, to 814. And um, I think he was in his 70s when he died. He was pretty old, I know. And his real name is actually uh, Carolus Magnus, which means Charles the Great. But over time, the French called him Charlemagne. They kind of slurred the name together. And at first, he was a king. He was born. He ruled as the king of the Carolingian. Uh, like the area that he reigned originally was in that lighter green colored area, which was originally the kingdom of the Franks at that point. And then they believe that over time, that Charlemagne would expand this state into an empire, which was called all kinds of names. Charlemagne's empire, the Carolingian empire, the Frankish empire, doesn't really have a real name, I guess. Uh, they call it all kinds of names. And um, there was a, a writer that wrote about Charlemagne named Einhard. Einhard was a Christian monk at the time. And uh, he wrote a book about Charlemagne called The Life of Charlemagne. And so he's the reason why we know a lot about Charlemagne and his reign. And the book is actually called The Life of Charles, but later they changed his name to Charlemagne. So it's usually either name is what he's usually called. Uh, how large was uh, Charlemagne's empire? Uh, the empire basically, um, you can see here, controlled most of all France, part of northern Spain, northern Germany, where Saxony is now, Bavaria. You can see it controlled most of Italy. So this empire at the time was actually larger than the Byzantine Empire in the east. It was that bigger. So it was pretty large size. And uh, the only thing he didn't have was like the rest of Spain and the rest of Germany. And you can see they had really control, of course, where Britain is. So it's pretty big, uh, that empire. Uh, Charlemagne was very important. He converted a lot of people to Christianity. In fact, people used to joke that Charlemagne was the right arm of God. And I think some of the Christians even called him <laughs> Iron Charles. You know, they called him <laughs> as well, Iron Charles. Uh, now, in 800, uh, of course, one of the most famous things that happened was the Pope at the time, Pope Leo III, crowned Charlemagne Emperor, Emperor of the Franks, uh, basically. Supposedly it happened on Christmas Day, uh, and um, they believe that um, with him being crowned, that that basically created what is Charlemagne's empire, the Carolingian Empire, and some believe that it was kind of like this um, recreation of a Western Roman Empire, but ruled by the Franks. So, so it's like some kind of Germanic version of it. And uh, they believe that's what the Pope was trying to do, trying to create this Germanic, you know, Roman Empire in the West to rival the Byzantines in the East. And uh, the, the uh, church... Uh, kind of used the Franks as a, as a protector, to protect the Catholic Church uh, from enemies of them, the Byzantines and others that didn't like the Catholic faith, you know. And so um, that's basically um, why that was important. Um, later, they believe that uh, this um, Frankish Empire was the creator of the Holy Roman Empire, which is what they would call Germany later, and um, Germany will be mostly made up of territories that are predominantly east of France, 
uh, from northern Germany, like into part of Italy, um, like the southern part of Italy, I guess. But include like Germany, Austria, Hungary, maybe northern Italy. We're kind of in it as a whole. And Charlemagne's kind of viewed as the founder of it, although they really believe that the first real Holy Roman Emperor wasn't um, until a ruler named Otto the first ruled later in Germany, which I'll see if I can mention later as well. So uh, what happened to his empire? Well, um, Charlemagne had a son named um, Louis the Pious or Louis the First, who reigned, um, he reigned a bunch of years, Louis the Pious, from, uh, if you want to know, 18, 814 to 840. And um, around 840, um, he was kind of, he had become ill, um, Louis the Pious. I think he had mental problems or something like that, they know. And his sons started fighting over the empire. And so from 840 to 843, it was like the grandsons of Charlemagne, uh, basically began fighting over the whole thing. And what happened was in uh, 843 CE, in a treaty called the Treaty of Verdun, they broke up Charlemagne's empire into three parts, which you can see in this map here. And uh, you can see it was divided into like a western part, middle part, and an eastern part. And uh, their actual original names uh, were called, this one was called um, Western uh, Francia. That was Middle Francia. And that was Eastern Francia. That's actually the real names, what they called it. Then they divided like these names you see there, like the West Frankish Kingdom, the Central Kingdom, and the East Frankish Kingdom. Well, the ones that are like here and here, like this one right here in the uh, west, that would become France. The Kingdom of France would be established here. This would be like Germany, Kingdom of Germany, which they later call the Holy Roman Empire in the Middle Ages. And then like this areas that were in the middle, that became like different states. Like that became parts of Italy here. Switzerland, I think, was up in here. And in the north, you've got other states that kind of emerged there, like the Netherlands and, I don't know if Belgium's there. Maybe Belgium is there. Like Belgium, Netherlands is kind of like at the top of it right there. But all those little minor states that are kind of in the middle between Germany and France are created like right there uh, because of it. But those are all the uh, different rulers that kind of divided them off. Uh, which were uh, Charles the Bald, Lothair, and Louis the German. Uh, those were all like sons of Louis the Pious or Louis the First, who were like Charlemagne's grandsons. They're the ones that broke it up and all that. And the Frankish Empire, you know, was never the same after that. Uh, you know, I think the dynasty itself of the Carolingians goes to like 911 or something like that in the early 10th century. But um, the Franks began to decline. Uh, what happens in parts of Western, Central, Eastern Europe is that you got the Vikings come in, which I'll talk about later, like next week, which we'll get more into the, you know, the rise of the Middle Ages and all that. We'll talk about more about the early to high Middle Ages and discuss like the Viking uh, peril that comes in because you got the Viking Age where the Vikings terrorized parts of Europe. Then um, I also get into um, discussing like, I guess, events of the high Middle Ages. I know the Crusades will be the main thing we'll talk about. And if we have any time, we'll get into other topics later into the late later Middle Ages overall. So that's it for this podcast uh, for week five.